Gigabyte's X870e Aorus Elite Wi-Fi 7 is priced at £290 here in the UK and that's fairly cheap for a brand new motherboard. It's got socket AM5 and it supports Zen 5 processors with DDR5 memory and Gigabyte would like to introduce us to their nifty Wi-Fi 7 features, USB 4 on the I.O. panel. It's also got an emphasis on cooling and Gigabyte would also like to show us their snap. On the face of it, Gigabyte's pulled off a neat trick with the X870e Aorus Elite Wi-Fi 7. The name claims great things. X870e is AMD's latest and greatest chipset. And Elite? Well, let's face it, that has to be top of the stack, doesn't it? Although Master also sounds like it's top of the stack. But on the face of it, this is the absolute business. And yet the price is more mid-range. Just under £300, including VAT here in the UK, is certainly mid-range. I don't think we can quite claim its budget, however. That would need to be under £200. How have they managed to give you a top-of-the-line motherboard at a mid-range price? Well, for one thing, let's be absolutely straightforward here. X870e is the same as X670e. It's just a naming thing. The one difference is that with X870e, you definitely get two USB 4 ports on the I.O. panel. That's true of every X870e and every X870 motherboard on the market. AMD mandates it so. So we have an X670e motherboard with USB 4 at a sensible price. And yet it looks the absolute business. One way that Gigabyte has presumably cut costs is by including very little in the way of accessories. You get the absolute minimum of literature. You need to go to their website to get a user manual. We get two SATA cables. Then again, if you're using M.2 storage, do you even use SATA these days? One of those clever little dongles, which goes on the front panel headers to connect the cables from your motherboard case buttons. And this antenna called Wi-Fi Easy Plug. Well, it certainly plugs fairly easily, so that's a win. It also unplugs. So we return to our opening question. How on earth has Gigabyte apparently supplied a premium motherboard at a mid-range price? I think the best thing we can do is take off some of this hardware and look beneath the surface. The theme of 2024 is easy PC building. Easy click and easy latch on Gigabyte's names. Off with this M.2 cover. We have a button there to release your graphics card from its slot. Away with your M.2 heatsink. You can see I have a crucial T700 SSD installed. And that's also tool free removal. And installation. And you'll note we have the primary SSD above the graphics card and three slots below the graphics card, four in total. Earlier I removed all the heat sinks from the motherboard to reveal the PCI Express slots, the M.2s and the VRMs. The VRMs are arranged in a 16 plus 2 plus 2 configuration and are rated each at 60 amps. They are cooled by VRM Thermal Armor Advanced and the main M.2 has a Thermal Guard L. The three expansion slots from top to bottom, PCI Express Gen 5 by 16, PCI Express Gen 4 by 4 and PCI Express Gen 3 by 2. The storage is three M.2 Gen 5s by 4 and one M.2 Gen 4x4, along with four SATA 6 gigabit per second. For USB support on the rear I.O. panel, we have two USB 4 Type C's rated at 40 gigabits per second, and two USB Type A's rated at 10 gigabits per second, along with four USB Type A's rated at 5 gigabits per second. We also have internal headers for one USB C rated at 20 gigabits per second, two USB Type A's rated at 5 gigabits per second. On the rear I.O. panel, there are four USB 2.0s, and there are headers for four more USB 2.0s. The graphics output is HDMI 2.1. Ethernet is Realtek 2.5 gigabit, and internally we have MediaTek Wi-Fi 7 and Bluetooth 5.3. On the subject of the Wi-Fi 7, this is a version 1.0 of this motherboard. I note that Gigabyte lists a version 1.1. 
the change seems to be from MediaTek to Realtek. I had no problems with the MediaTek hardware whatsoever. In fact, it was very nice. Whether the Realtek hardware is better, more reliable, perhaps they're dual sourcing, no idea. But uh, there might be something to bear in mind. One of the features I like about the board is that you have this ventilated rear I.O. panel, which allows air to get from the heat sinks and to the outside, which is good, or I suppose cooling air might get in. Uh, but either way, instead of having a, a, a dam to prevent hot air from getting past the VRM heat sinks, we have something to help. There's no active cooler, it's just a little bit of ventilation. The layout of the board I like, it's very good. Headers and connectors across the foot of the board, three fan headers grouped together there. As I've already shown, we have internal headers for USB and for SATA along the side here. And then at the top of the board, we have micro buttons, uh, so we have a power button and we have a multifunction which can be reconfigured, but by default that's reset. And we have postcode debug and we have three fan headers here lined up together. And then we have the eight pin EPS. Sometimes you'll find an extra fan header in that location there, which can be a bit awkward to reach. We haven't got that, it's purely power. The layout works well. There are plenty of features packed into this ATX design. I'm glad that Gigabyte hasn't felt the urge to go for E80X because that can lead to more hassle when you put your motherboard in your case. More space required. And in this instance, I don't think it would bring anything to the party. Done a tour of the hardware. The next job is to get the motherboard up and running. Processor I'm using is a Ryzen 7 9700X, so the latest Zen 5 parts. And we have some G-Skill Royal Neo rated at DDR5-8000. As you've seen, I have a Crucial T700 Gen 5 SSD. For the graphics card, I have this Gigabyte RTX 4080 Gaming OC. And my test PC is powered by the latest Seasonic Focus GX1000, which is ATX3. This power supply was rated by Alan, not this power supply. He had a black one, I've got the white one, and he liked it a very great deal. And the first job, once the system was running, was to update the BIOS. Slightly surprisingly, there are a few BIOS updates available already for this brand new motherboard. The process was as straightforward as always. Once the system was updated, I was able to set a fan curve for the cooling system and to enable Expo for our G-Skill memory. Once the PC was in Windows, we used Gigabyte's control center software to update all the drivers and also to install some of Gigabyte's utilities. The same control center software also updated the firmware within the Gigabyte graphics card, which was a handy bonus. Our first job was to check out the performance of USB 4. When I recently reviewed an MSI X870E carbon Wi-Fi, I hadn't been impressed by the USB 4, although I figured there was some explanation beyond the motherboard. You can see here the performance on that MSI using an external USB 4 enclosure, first on USB-C 10 gigabits per second, and then on USB 4, which is rated at 40 gigabits per second, but clearly operates around twice as fast as the USB 10. I retested that MSI motherboard after a Windows update, and the performance jumped forward. When I ran that same Crystal Dismark test on this Gigabyte X870E Aorus Elite Wi-Fi 7, I was very pleased to see the scores were exactly in line with the MSI Carbon Wi-Fi. So hurrah, USB 4 works correctly, and it seems the problem I originally had was down to Windows 11. And now let's look at some other performance charts. Starting with Geekbench 6 Multicore, we see the Gigabyte beats the MSI by a margin of a couple of hundred points. Both motherboards using the same processor and the same memory. Moving on to Cinebench R23 Multicore, the roles are very slightly reversed with MSI beating the Gigabyte by a small margin. The Ada 64 memory bandwidth test is more about the memory than the motherboard and we see the Gigabyte performs very competently and beats the MSI on the same memory by a very small margin. 3 d Mark CPU profile is pretty much a dead heat between the Gigabyte and the MSI and our takeaway so far is that Gigabyte is doing a decent job. And we move on to tests that combine CPU and graphics. And in 3D Mark Time Spy, we see Gigabyte beating MSI by a very small margin, which is quite satisfying when you consider the Gigabyte is significantly cheaper than the MSI. And then we move on to gaming. 
1080p on a high preset and Gigabyte beats MSI by 3 FPS both in terms of average and 1% lows. Avatar Frontiers of Pandora at 1080p on Ultra preset is essentially a tie between Gigabyte and MSI, but Gigabyte is slightly ahead on the 1% lows. Assassin's Creed Mirage on Ultra High preset at 1080p, you have to say the Gigabyte and the MSI are tying on this one. Cyberpunk 2077 at 1080p, Ultra preset, Gigabyte beats MSI by just a tiny margin. And the same is true in Total War Pharaoh at 1080p on Ultra Preset. Gigabyte for the win. As a world leading manufacturer, CyberPower PC UK expertly builds each PC with the largest range of parts available in the UK. We handle all your packages with care and ship them directly to you on next day delivery. Visit cyberpowersystem.co.uk. It's noteworthy that in those performance charts, the Gigabyte repeatedly beats MSI, albeit by a very small margin, using exactly the same hardware in both installations. We can see that Gigabyte has made a number of changes from 600 series chipset motherboards to 800 series, but the same is true for MSI. So we have to wonder, is this something to do with this questionably named AI Snatch feature? Clearly when we see claims about AI we immediately have sceptical views. In this instance perhaps it is doing something behind the scenes. We left this motherboard running on auto, yet it seems to deliver slightly more performance than we expected. So this may well be a win for AI. Other features such as Gigabyte's DIY friendly innovations are welcome. They make building a PC much easier but we've seen all these features before from other motherboard manufacturers. We particularly like the easy debug zone, however those buttons are very small and they're crammed close together. If you've got a good view of your motherboard on the test bench, it's not a problem. Inside a case, however, it's a different story. And the layout of the BIOS is also good, and Gigabyte's BIOS have been a pleasure to work with for many years. One point I haven't particularly laboured in this review is about the VRMs. We've got 16 by 60 amps, which is more than enough to deal with a Ryzen 7 processor. And the thing is, they work perfectly well. They've got chunky great big coolers on them. In my testing, I didn't see a temperature above 65 degrees Celsius, albeit with ambient temperatures of around 20 Celsius here in the UK at this time of year. The thing is, 60 something Celsius is lovely and cool in my opinion. However, the current crop of motherboards are all very good. 65 Celsius is actually relatively warm. Many boards are operating in the 50s these days. So the VRMs are nothing particularly special, but they're absolutely up to the job. And we come to my conclusion. Pros and cons. The good points first. You've got support for four M.2 SSDs in total, three of which are Gen 5. The Wi-Fi 7 works well, and the Easy Plug Antenna is a neat feature. As I mentioned, however, earlier, there might conceivably be a question mark over the MediaTek hardware versus Realtek. The motherboard is good value for money at under £300, and you've got decent performance with DDR5 8000. I'm not suggesting for a second 8000 is required, but it's not particularly expensive memory. 6000 will do you nicely, but you do get an extra couple of percent with 8000. Cons the negative points. The two bottom expansion slots are rather basic. The bandwidth has been given over to storage is my opinion. So those two slots you can pretty much ignore. Having said that, apart from your graphics card going in the primary slot, do you actually have anything to plug into those two slots at all? And secondly, the layout of these micro buttons is a little bit fiddly. But that's a fairly minor complaint. Overall, I've been back and forth on my score. I came close to giving this nine out of 10 a must have, I've just fallen on the side of 8.5 out of 10 and worth buying. Either way, it's a good motherboard at a fair price. Head over to kitguru.net to read our news and reviews. And don't forget, we're also on TikTok.